Welcome to this video on pressure support ventilation. This is uh, a video in the series of videos that we have on the respiratory review page on modes of mechanical ventilation. So we're going to break down this mode of mechanical ventilation and um, answer some of these questions that we have highlighted down here and hopefully leave you with a better understanding of pressure support ventilation. <clears throat> now, as I've said in many other videos on mechanical ventilation, one of the biggest problems with understanding ventilation is terminology. Pressure support ventilation um, on different ventilators is called different things. It can be called uh, CPAP and pressure support. Um, it can be called simply spontaneous ventilation. Um, there's lots of different terms for this mode of ventilation, but the theory behind it all is, is, is the same. So let's get stuck in a little bit. When um, What I encourage you to do before watching this video is go back and watch a couple of different videos that we have on the respiratory review page. Go and watch the videos on the other modes of mechanical ventilation because um, those will be useful in understanding this. Go and watch the videos on phases of a breath, specifically looking at trigger variables, limit variables, cycle variables in terms of how a breath is constructed. Um, and that will really help with, with this video. Uh, this would be about 40 minutes long if I had to recover those topics. So I encourage you to go back and watch those if you don't understand them. Um, so let's get stuck into this. The crux of pressure support ventilation is that the patient has as much control over their breathing as we can give them. Okay, so they're on a ventilator, but they are controlling most of um, what's happening with their breaths. Unlike controlled ventilation, there is no set respiratory rate. There is no set minute ventilation. Um, we don't control when the breaths take place or how big they are or how much minute ventilation is going to be achieved across the minute. That's all controlled by the patient. Okay, so the good thing about that is that makes it a little bit more comfortable for the patient, right? The patient determines their respiratory rate. They determine how long inspiration takes place, how big each breath is, okay? And we just sort of support them, right? We support them by giving them pressure, okay? Pressure, support. So let's look at these waveforms and it's just, this may look like complete um, foreign gobbledygook to you right now, but that's fine. We'll, we'll sort of piece our way through it. So at the bottom here, we have a pressure um, waveform, okay? This baseline along the white line is five. That's because our baseline pressure is usually elevated. It's usually a positive baseline. This wouldn't be zero normally on a mechanical ventilator, right? We set a PEEP level. Um, so this is their baseline. So this is where they're kind of hanging out. And then the patient decides that they want a breath. Remember, we don't tell them when they want a breath. They decide for themselves when they want to breathe. So when they do that, they're going to make an effort to breathe. Okay, What that's going to do, it's going to cause a drop in the pressure in the circuit. And you can see that right here, this sort of, this sort of deflection below 5. It's a little drop in the circuit pressure. And that tells the ventilator that the patient's trying to take a breath. Okay, So then what the ventilator does is it increases the pressure from 5 up to a certain point. Here we have it increasing up to 15. Um, so the difference between these two would be 10, right? So the patient makes an effort to breathe and the ventilator increases the pressure in the circuit from the baseline pressure up to some point, which we're gonna, we're, we're gonna decide, okay? That increase in pressure causes flow to enter the patient, right? If you increase the pressure, flow goes into the patient's lungs. So then we can see here on our flow waveform that when the patient takes the breath, there's a sharp increase in, in the flow, right? Leading to this point here, which is the peak flow. So this is the peak inspiratory flow, PIF, okay? And then th that flow is gonna decay over the course of the breath. It's gonna start very, very quickly as you go through the big airways like the trachea and the main bronchi. And then that flow is gonna slow down as it gets into the tighter air passages, okay? So as that flow decays, it's going to decay eventually down to zero if we let it. Um, but we don't let it. Once that uh, flow decays down to a certain point, you can see it here, the breath ends, okay? So this point here is the flow cycle off, which sounds confusing, but all it is is determining when the breath is going to end. The breath ends when the flow decays down to a certain point, okay? This is usually set at around 25%. 
Okay, so when the, the flow decays down to 25% of the peak flow, the breath ends. Okay, and as a result of that pressure being elevated and that flow entering the patient, we get a tidal volume, right? The, there's a volume generated as a result of that increasing pressure causing the flow to increase, which causes the volume to increase. Okay, and that's, that's the breath. So what, are we, what have we def determined? We've determined that the patient decides when the breath's going to take place. We've, um, the volume will vary, and we'll get to why in a second. And it's the breath ends when the flow decays down to a certain percentage of the peak flow, and that's called the flow cycle off. Okay, so that's a pressure supported breath. The patient makes the effort, and we've supported that effort with some pressure. Okay, pressure support. So let's talk about these breath characteristics. The trigger variable, again, go back to the, the, the video on these if you don't understand these. The trigger variable is what causes the breath to begin? What triggers the breath to begin? So we can say that it's patient, right? It's patient effort, firstly. Um, but specifically, it's due to a drop in the circuit pressure, okay? So the variable would be pressure, right? On some ventilators, you can also do this using flow. If the patient generates enough of a change in flow in the circuit, it can trigger the breath. But it's going to be pressure or flow, usually pressure. Okay, so the breath begins when the patient makes that effort. And you can see that green deflection in the, in the pressure wave from there. In the middle of the breath, in the, the something that's limited within the breath but doesn't cause the breath to end, is pressure, right? We're going to elevate the pressure up to a certain point, And you can see here that we hold this, this pressure at this point for a certain period of time until the breath ends when the flow tells us the breath is going to end right so we're limiting the pressure in the circuit during the breath okay so our limit variable is going to be pressure right and then the cycle variable what causes the breath to end well we've said here that once the flow decays down to a certain percentage of peak flow the breath will end okay so this the breath ends do you, um, the ending of the breath is caused by flow, so the cycle variable is flow. Okay, so this is important. This is this is very technical terminology stuff, but this is important understanding how the breath ends. Okay, so what do we set on the ventilator? Well, we're going to set our baseline pressure here, which we always set. Okay, that's our PEEP. We'll do a whole series of videos on PEEP, don't worry. So if you understand it, great. If not, um, wait for those videos to come out. Um, that we're also going to set our pressure support level. Quickly, terminology thing, PEEP can also be called CPAP, Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. This is PEEP, Positive End Expiratory Pressure. Again, terminology thing. It's something which I wish was less confusing, but it is what it is. We set our pressure support level. So here, remember how we see it said that we went from 5 up to 15, and that change in pressure was 10. Okay, So that was that's our pressure support level. Okay, and this is 10 because that's the difference between the the where we end up and where we started. Okay, so we set our pressure support. We're going to set something called rise, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, we're going to set our FiO2, i.e., how much oxygen we're giving, right? How much O2. Um, and what else we can? Oh, we're also going to set something called apnea criteria. And I'll get into that in a second criteria. So what's rise? Rise essentially is just how quickly we rise up to that peak pressure that we set. Remember, we're going from 5 up to 15. Okay, that change of pressure is 10, 5 up to 15. Now, how quickly we go from 5 to 15 is the rise. In this, in this one here, you can see how it's pretty much just straight up and down. So we almost go straight from 5 all the way up to 15 immediately. In this one, it's kind of slanted, right? It's kind of on an angle there. So that's that would be a slower rise. The, it's the rise time. How long does it take to get us from 5 up to 15? Okay, that's what rise is. Not super important in this context. Um, so and then, um, so what do these things do? Let's just maybe... Um, qualify these next to them. So PEEP, we set that for oxygenation, oxygenation and recruitment. Okay, we want the lung tissue to be open and having an elevated pressure all the time helps to keep that lung tissue open. We'll do, as I said, we'll do lots of videos on PEEP. Pressure support, what that does is it augments 
augments the patient's tidal volume, right? If we increase our pressure support, we're probably going to increase the person's tidal volume because we're giving them more help to take a breath. If we decrease the pressure support, um, it's more likely to decrease their tidal volume because we're giving them less help, okay? Um, and then obviously FiO2 is just how much oxygen we've given and rise is what we just talked about. So apnea criteria, what is that? Well, imagine we're here now, down the end, and the patient doesn't make this effort. This little drop in the circuit pressure doesn't happen. They don't take a breath. Maybe they are still got a little bit of anesthetic on board or maybe they've, um, they don't have an intact respiratory drive, okay? What's gonna happen? Well, they're not, nothing's gonna happen for, for a while, right? Because the, the, the mode of ventilation is spontaneous. It requires the patient to make respiratory effort. It requires the patient to take breaths. And if they don't, the ventilator isn't gonna give them any. But so that's not great, right? We don't want that to that to happen. So in order to protect against that, we have these things called apnea criteria. So maybe we'll just talk a little bit about this. So this here would be no effort. So we determine that as an apnea, right? This is apnea, and that's not good because that causes them to hypoventilate. Their CO2 will go up, their their oxygen sats will probably start to drop, and and we don't want them not breathing. So we set apnea criteria and that is to protect against sort of profound hypoxia and profound hypoventilation so um, apnea criteria so what we're going to do is we're going to say okay how long can they go apneic for before we intervene okay so that's called an apnea time all right we're going to set that on the ventilator we choose it and it's usually about 20 seconds to 30 seconds but again, you can manipulate that if you need to. If someone's having big prolonged apneas all the time, this we don't want them clicking into apnea ventilation because it'd be it'd be frustrating for the patient and for everyone else. So we can you can adjust this apnea time, and then we're gonna have apnea ventilation, right? We need to be able to ventilate the person um, if they stop breathing on their own. So we need to set a respiratory rate, and we need to set. Um, a tidal volume we essentially put them into volume control now on some ventilators you can also put them into pressure control but for, for, that's not really relevant I mean we basically apnea criteria is just what happens if the patient doesn't breathe well we need to do it for them with the ventilator so we set a certain amount of time they can go apneic for and then we set the conditions for the ventilation if they do go apneic and that's called apnea ventilation so that's super important that's a protection thing right that's a sort of safety net if the patient doesn't breathe so Let's talk about the sort of pros and cons. We've already discussed a couple of them, so we should be able to should be able to talk about these. Um, so why? What are the pros and cons? So it's it's good because the patient, um, the patient and the ventilator will be synchronous. Patient ventilator synchrony is a big topic in mechanical ventilation. And the reason there's good patient ventilator synchrony is because the patient determines when they breathe, they determine how long inspiration is, they determine how big their tidal volume is. So that increases synchrony. And what that does is it increases comfort. It's more comfortable to be breathing when you choose when to breathe and how big your breaths are. What other benefits do we have? So we've talked about ventilator synchrony, patient ventilator synchrony, and the, the comfort that that brings. Um, this also allows us to balance the work of the vent, right? The ventilator doing some work um, balanced with um, the patient doing some work, right? So as we... Um, as we adjust our pressure support level, we adjust the amount of work the patient has to do versus the amount of work that the, the ventilator is helping with. So what this really leads to is that this is great for weaning. Okay, so it's great for weaning people off mechanical ventilation because we can gradually lower the amount of help that we're giving them to take their own tidal volumes until they're able just to spontaneously take tidal volumes on their own without any help at all from the from the um, from the ventilator or without with or with minimal help from the ventilator so that's those are the benefits of pressure support ventilation and some of the the setbacks or the drawbacks are we there's no um, there's no um, guaranteed tidal volume right there's no set 
tidal volume. So that's kind of a benefit and a and a um, and a sort of drawback as well. So we don't we can't guarantee a set tidal volume. And similarly, um, there's no certain um, minute ventilation, right? We don't we don't have a specific minute ventilation that we're going to get. Um, it's all going to be dependent on on the patient. So as a result, that leaves us um, we're less able, right? Less able to control their um, their blood gas, their ABG, because really the patient's respiratory drive is going to determine what their arterial blood gas is. We're not going to be able to manipulate that blood gas as closely as we would in a controlled mode of ventilation, and they require a um, intact respiratory drive, right? They need to be breathing on their own. They can't be anesthetized. They can't be super critically ill. They can't They can't have a closed head injury and not be breathing spontaneously. So there's a sort of specific population of people this is going to work for. And, and there's also a, a, a large population that it isn't going to work for. They do need to be breathing on their own. And they need to have sufficient lung mechanics to allow them to breathe on 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 its pressure port ventilation. So when is it useful? The big one to take away is weaning. I'm not going to get into all the other modes. There's there's literature out there about using pressure spontaneous ventilation and pressure port ventilation in critical illness, but we'll get into that later on when we get a bit more in depth in it. But for now the big one is weaning. We want to allow the patients to slowly take over their own work of breathing. So let's just to finish we're going to go through a couple of these what I've drawn on these uh, waveforms here is really three different breaths it looks like it's all the same thing but just to highlight some of the sort of details of it and these aren't super important but they're they're useful to know so you can see here that we get a volume generated when the patient takes a breath so they make an effort now we add some pressure support once they've got an effort flow starts and then they have a breath right in this second example here, you can see that the tidal volume that's generated is quite a bit smaller. So even though they got the same level of pressure support, they triggered a breath, got the same amount of pressure support as they did before, there's a lower tidal volume. So this would be someone with decreased um, decrease lung compliance, right? Um, they get a smaller volume generated as a result of the same level of pressure. This is just speaking to the variability that you get in pressure port ventilation. And in this last context here, you see that really this should be a little bit lower down there, um, a bit of a deeper inspiration. Um, they get the same level of pressure support, a deeper pull in from the patient, and the flow goes up higher, and then we get a larger tidal volume. So this would probably be something like increased patient effort right they so th you can see that they if they want to they can take a bigger breath they get the same amount of pressure spot as they did before but it allows them to take a, a bigger breath that's just because they're making more effort okay so pressure spot ventilation is variable there's going to be lots of variance in the tidal volume there's going to be variance in the minute ventilation we talked about how the breath is delivered how the breath starts how what's how it's limited and how the breath ends what we set on the ventilator, um, how we protect against apnea, and the sort of pros and cons of when pressure port ventilation is useful.